We already met Isaac in Abraham's story. In Genesis 17, when God gave Abraham the covenant of circumcision, he also told Abraham that he and Sarah would have a son to be named Isaac, and the messianic promise would continue through him. In Genesis 18, God and two angels, in man-like forms, visited Abraham and reiterated that the son of promise would be born the next year. In Genesis 21, Isaac was born as promised, and soon after, Hagar and Ishmael were sent away. And in Genesis 24, we saw how Abraham made sure that Isaac got a good wife in Rebekah. In Genesis 25, 20 to 26, Isaac was 40 when he married Rebekah. She was initially barren for 20 years until Isaac prayed for God's help and she became pregnant with twins. They struggled with each other in the womb, a foretaste of how they would get along after birth. However, Rebekah asked God about the difficult pregnancy, and he told her that both boys would become nations, and the older would serve the younger. So she knew Jacob would be blessed somehow. Esau came out first, covered with red hair, while Jacob came out second, holding on to Esau's heel, thus the name Yaakob, he who trips by the heel. Later, Jacob will prove to be a bit of a schemer, and a deceiver. In verses 27 to 34, we find that the boys are very different. Esau was an outdoor he-man, favored by his father, while Jacob is a peaceful homebody, favored by his mother. It's hard to not have slight favorites in your children, but Isaac, Rebekah, and Jacob show us the problems you create when the favoring is done openly. In the birthright, the oldest son gets an extra portion of inheritance. With only two boys, that means there are three portions and Esau is in line for two of them. One day Jacob has some stew cooking. Esau comes in from hunting and he's hungry enough to bargain away his extra portion of the inheritance for a bowl of soup. Thus Esau despised his birthright and earned his later reputation as a wicked and profane man. In Genesis 26, 1 through 5, God passed the promises to Abraham on to Isaac, personal blessings and protection. God will give the land of Canaan to his descendants who will be multiplied like the stars, and through your seed, masculine singular, all nations will be blessed. Paul later notes that the seed is the Messiah Jesus in Galatians 3.16. In verses 6 through 11, Isaac is living in Gerar, Philistine territory, and he follows in his dad's footsteps. Imagining the local men killing him for his beautiful wife, he has spread it around that she is his sister. Literally, she was the daughter of his cousin Bethuel. But sound familiar? Something to think about. How many bad habits or ideas have we adopted from our parents? How often do we imagine our neighbors to be worse people than they really are? Well, the king sees Isaac and Rebekah doing some PDA and asks why he has been spreading the false story that she is his sister. The earlier issue with Abraham occurred in this area and had become part of the local morality. Abraham's family is under God's protection. Don't mess with them. Well, the king scolds him about the possibility that one of the locals might have forced himself on Rebekah, and then God would punish the community. The king lets the local men know that they need to keep their hands off of Rebekah. In verses 12 through 33, Isaac is a grain farmer and doing very well, along with flocks and herds. Even though Abraham and the ruler of his day had a covenant concerning Abraham's wells, people were jealous of his success and started stopping up his wells. His men dug more wells, but local herdsmen complained that they owned all the water. Well, rather than fight for his rights, Isaac moves on until he finds an open, peaceful area and settles there. Abimelech, a title rather than a personal name, comes, and like earlier with Abraham, there is a recognition that God is blessing Isaac 
so they need to get along with him. In verses 34 and 35, while Isaac has generally avoided trouble, we find there are other ways that life can go sour. What has Isaac's older son Esau been up to? Well, he married a couple of Hittite girls, and they have brought grief to Isaac and Rebekah. In Genesis 27, Isaac starts thinking about his age and the need to pass on his patriarchal blessing, and he intends to give it to his favorite, Esau, and he sends him out to get some game. Well, knowing Jacob is supposed to dominate, Rebekah decides to do a little maneuvering herself. She fixes the food Isaac is expecting and dresses Jacob up so that he will smell and feel like Esau and sends him in to deceive his father and get the blessing before Esau returns. Well, while Isaac can't see well, he is suspicious of the voice, but he utters the divinely guided blessing. The deception and the blessing completed, Esau shows up. Isaac is mad, Esau is mad enough to kill Jacob, and Rebekah is worried enough for Jacob's safety that she decides to send him off to stay with his uncle Laban until the situation cools down. Jacob the schemer is about to be schooled by a master. The chapter ends with another comment from Rebekah that she is so tired of Esau's Hittite wives that if Jacob marries a Hittite girl, her life won't be worth living. In Genesis 28, 1 through 5, Isaac has cooled down. He blesses Jacob and tells him that he cannot marry a Canaanite woman and needs to go and marry one of Uncle Laban's daughters, a cousin. He tells him that he wants the promises to Abraham that have been passed to him to be fulfilled through Jacob. So Jacob takes off for Padan Aram and Uncle Laban's Institute of Advanced Trickery. In verses 6 through 9, Esau sees what has happened. Isaac has blessed Jacob and sent him away specifically to get a wife elsewhere. Having not considered their approval in taking his first two wives, Esau finally realizes that the Hittite girls have created grief for his parents. But was he just naive or a couple matzo balls short of a happy meal? But without discussing it with his parents, Esau decides to add another filly to his stable, at least a little closer to the family, in a daughter of Ishmael. In verses 10 through 22, Jacob is on his way and probably thinking pretty seriously about life when, in a dream, God passes the promises to Abraham on to him. He sees a ladder or a staircase to heaven with angels going up and down. Jesus will later apply this to himself in John 1.51. He is the way to heaven. And God promises the land to him and his descendants, who will fill the land someday. And through his seed, masculine singular, one seed, Jesus, all the earth's families will be blessed. God will be with him until he has done what he has promised. Jacob is sobered by the experience makes a vow to serve God, and renames the location Bethel, or House of God. In Genesis 29, Jacob meets Rachel, and he's a goner, hopelessly in love with her. Uncle Laban welcomes him, and also has an older daughter named Leah, with weak eyes. He agrees to let Jacob marry Rachel for seven years of work. Well, the seven years are over, the marriage feast is over, and Laban switches the girls, which Jacob doesn't realize until morning because he was probably a bit hammered from too much partying. We have to wonder why did Leah go along with it? Did Dad give her orders? Was she willing to get a man by any means? We don't know. When Jacob objects that he worked seven years for Rachel, Laban comes out with this lame story that a local tradition requires that older daughters must be married first. How did he say this with a straight face? And he adds that Jacob can have Rachel too after the honeymoon week and for seven more years of work. Laban throws in Zilpah and Bilhah as maids for Leah and Rachel. Remember, this is not a fairy tale, but real life going on, and it can get ugly. 
Without a doubt, Laban is a big-time liar and trickster. But remember, Jacob dressed up like his brother to deceive his father. So what goes around comes around. Genesis 29.31 tells us that God saw Leah was unloved by Jacob, so he compensated her with fertility, while Rachel was barren and could not have children. So with God's blessing, Genesis 29.32-35 tells us that Leah cranked out the first four of what will be twelve sons and then twelve tribes of Jacob or Israel, Reuben, Simeon, Levi, and Judah. In Genesis 30, 1 through 25, the childbearing contest heats up. Rachel is upset that she's not had any children and first blames Jacob, but then she gives him her maid, Bilhah, and out comes Dan, and then Naphtali. Not to be outdone, Leah gives Jacob her maid, Zilpah, and out comes Gad and Asher. Mandrake roots, thought to aid fertility, are found, so Rachel and Leah start bargaining over those and who gets Jacob tonight. And Leah gives birth to Issachar, then Zebulun, and a daughter named Dinah. Rachel finally gets pregnant and gives birth to Joseph. In chapter 35, Rachel will die in childbirth with Benjamin. In verses 26 through 43, Jacob was getting tired of prospering Laban and wanted to strike out on his own. He agreed with Laban that he would take the speckled, spotted, and black sheep and goats for his own. Since most were solid, lighter colors, Laban figured he'd come out good. However, Jacob employed a possible superstition and also did some controlled selective breeding and gradually built up his own sizable flock. In chapter 31, Jacob overheard Laban's boys talking about Jacob taking all of Laban's wealth, and they were all mad at him. So God told Jacob it was time for he, his wives, children, and flocks to go. Jacob told Rachel and Leah that he was tired of being cheated by Laban, and it looks like the girls seemed to have had enough of their dad, too. While Laban was out in the field, Rachel stole the household gods, which probably had something to do with inheritance, and Jacob was unaware of it. But off they all go. Laban took off after them, but on the way, God was protecting his program, and he appeared to Laban in a dream and told him to be careful what he did and said. When he looked for the idols, Rachel had put them under her camel saddle, was sitting on them, and claimed that she could not get up because it was her time of the month. Laban's daughters had learned a few things about deception and trickery from watching dear old dad all those years. Although he was angry, Laban took God's advice and parted from them peacefully. In Genesis 32, after encountering God's angels, Jacob contacts Esau and things begin to fall together for them to reunite after many years. Hearing that Esau was coming with 400 men, Jacob was concerned for his own safety and planned to put everyone else in front of him. But while alone, he wrestles with a man for a lengthy time and eventually concluded that he had wrestled with and seen the face of God and survived. It ends with his request for a blessing and his thigh is dislocated, which gives him a limp. When you wrestle with God, you will walk differently afterwards. It is at this point that his name is changed from Jacob to Israel, he who strives with God. In Genesis 33, Esau and Jacob meet up, but Jacob is a changed man and goes in front of all of his people, bowing down before Esau repeatedly. But Esau is also a changed man. He ran to Jacob, they embrace, kiss, and cry together. Not only has Jacob matured, but Esau has left his anger behind and does not even want a gift from Jacob. They separate in peace, and Jacob settled near Shechem. In Genesis 34, Jacob's daughter Dinah goes out to visit with the local Canaanite women, but is seen by a man named Shechem, who is deeply attracted to her 
rapes her, but loves her and speaks tenderly to her. He tells his father, Hamor, the prince of the land, that he wants her for a wife. Well, Jacob knew what happened, but he did not tell his sons. Hamor came to speak with Jacob about it, but Dinah's brothers find out what happened and are mad. Hamor offers to let them settle there, intermarry, and share the land, and they are willing to pay any bridal price. The sons deceitfully agree to go along only if all of the people will be circumcised. Hamor addresses his people, and they all agree. But while the men are healing from the surgery, Simeon and Levi stealthily killed every male, Hamor and Shechem, and looted the city. Jacob was annoyed with his two sons, who still thought they had done the right thing. In Genesis 35, God told Jacob to put away the foreign gods and idols that they had with them, probably Laban's household idols, and settle in Bethel. Rachel dies in childbirth with Benjamin, Joseph's younger brother. Reuben has relations with Rachel's maid, Bilhah. The sons of Jacob are named according to their respective birth mothers, and we are told that Isaac died at 180 years, with Esau and Jacob meeting up again to bury him. Genesis 36 tells us about Esau's family and descendants. In verses 6 and 7, we find that because of the sizes of their herds and available grass, Esau and Jacob separated on good terms. Esau's descendants became the Edomites. Jacob's twelve sons came from four mothers, and Genesis 37, 2 through 11 suggests that there was a mother-based strife and rivalry between the boys. When Joseph, a son of Rachel, brought back a bad report about the sons of the two handmaids, Bilhah and Zilpah, was it accurate? or was he trash-talking them to his dad? It is said plainly that Jacob loved Joseph more than any of them, showed it by giving him a special tunic, and the brothers saw it and hated him. Joseph is also getting dreams, portraying himself as exalted, and the rest as bowing down to him, which were prophetic, but none of them knew that yet. The imagery of the sun, moon, and twelve stars in verses 9 and 10 for the patriarchal heads of Israel shows up later in Revelation 12, 1, 2, and 5 as the woman that brings forth the Messiah, Jesus. In verses 12 through 36, Joseph is sent to check on his brothers again, but this time some of the brothers have had enough. Joseph is thrown in a pit, some wanted to kill him, while Reuben wanted to go back and rescue him. But before he could do that, others saw the opportunity to sell him into Egyptian slavery. They took his robe, smeared some goat blood on it, and deceived Jacob, claiming that Joseph had been killed by wild animals. Ironic, as Jacob had also deceived his dad with his brother's clothing. However, in Egypt, Joseph is purchased by Potiphar, an important official who will protect him and eventually provide access to Pharaoh when the time is right. In Genesis 38, 1 through 10, we are shown that we're not dealing with the most spiritual guys on the block. Judah takes off and starts impregnating women. He sires Ur, Onan, and Shelah. He finds a wife for Ur named Tamar, and she'll wind up in the Messiah's lineage, but it gets messy. Ur was so evil that God took him out. Brothers were supposed to raise up children to keep their brother's family going, but Onan won't do his duty, so God took him out too. You don't see God stepping in and taking out people very often, so these guys were really bad and probably posed a threat to Tamar and the Messianic line. In verses 11 through 30, rather than keep his promise, it looks like Judah is not going to assign Shelah the task. So Tamar gets Judah to father a child by dressing up like a Canaanite temple prostitute and standing out where Judah will pass by on his way to the fields. He sees her, asks about the price, and leaves his seal, cord, and staff, 
That's kind of like leaving your driver's license and your credit card. He later tried to get them back, but she was no longer there. She conceives, and when Judah hears that she is pregnant and wants to punish her for immorality, she comes in holding up his identifying items, and he admits that she is more righteous than I. Two sons were born, and Perez will be in the Messiah's lineage. You can see that in Ruth 4, 18-22. Tamar was a Canaanite woman, and Perez a child of incest. But they are in Jesus' ancestry because he is the Messiah coming to rescue sinners from all backgrounds and all sins. In Genesis chapters 39 through 41, we're back in Egypt with Joseph, where God's providence has put him under the care of Potiphar, the officer over Pharaoh's bodyguard, who sees honesty and ability in him and puts all of his household under Joseph's care. The wrench, or the wench, in the program comes from Potiphar's wife, who lusts after this good-looking new man in the house, and when spurned by Joseph, she accuses him of rape. You know, the fury of a woman scorned and all that? Well, Potiphar was angry, but the fact that he put them in with royal prisoners who are under Potiphar's control suggests that he was not buying his wife's story, but had to do something with Joseph to save face, and this way he could still look out for him. Soon, Joseph would be overseeing all of the prisoners. In Genesis 40, it's not long before two of Pharaoh's closer servants, the cupbearer and baker, wind up in the prison. Joseph explains their dreams, which foretell what will happen to both of them. He tells them his story and asks them to remember him when they are restored to Pharaoh's court. In Genesis 41, two years later, Pharaoh has dreams foretelling the approaching seven-year famine, and he asks his magicians and wise men to explain it, but they're all stumped. The cupbearer tells Pharaoh of the Hebrew he met in prison, who correctly interpreted his dream, and Pharaoh requests that he be brought in. Joseph explains Pharaoh's dreams and advises him on a course of action to prepare. Well, Pharaoh likes Joseph's answer and concludes that there is nobody better for the job than this man with obvious divine guidance, so Joseph is suddenly elevated to the number two spot in Egypt, is given an Egyptian name and a wife, Asenath, through whom two sons are born, and he makes preparations for the coming famine. There is to this day a canal named after Joseph that feeds water from the Nile into a lake for irrigation purposes. In Genesis 42 through 44, when the famine hits, Jacob's family has to seek food in Egypt. Of course, they have to come to Joseph, who recognized them immediately, but they did not recognize him. First, they assumed that he was dead. Second, they last saw him at the age of 17. He is now 30, a high Egyptian official well-dressed, wearing makeup, speaking Egyptian through an interpreter. Joseph realized what his earlier dreams were pointing to, and he toyed with them a bit, accusing them of being spies and putting them in prison for three days, putting their money in the grain sacks and keeping Simeon as a hostage. When they return, seating them in birth order, which they noticed, feeding them from his own food, and giving his brother Benjamin five times more food than they, sending them home with their money again and his own cup in Benjamin's bag, then arresting and questioning them. We have already seen great emotion in Joseph, but in Genesis 45, 1 through 15, Joseph could contain himself no longer. He wept loudly and revealed himself to his brothers. He told them not to worry about revenge, for he had come to see all that had occurred as God's providence, moving him to Egypt to preserve his family, but also to help the Egyptians. He told them to go home, tell his father Jacob that he was alive and in a position of authority to move them all to Egypt and take care of them, as there were still five more years of the famine. 
In Genesis 45, 16 to 28, Pharaoh heard what had happened and also encouraged Joseph to tell his brothers to move their family to Egypt, where they would be given good land and provided for. Genesis 46 provides a listing of all Israel that moved to Egypt around 1876 BC, 66 people in all, with Joseph, Asenath, and the two boys, Manasseh and Ephraim, already in Egypt, a total of 70. We learn that Egyptians had their own biases too. They could not eat bread with Hebrews, and shepherds were loathsome to them. In Genesis 47, 1 through 12, Joseph presented five of his brothers and his father to Pharaoh, who welcomed them and offered them land in Goshen, well-watered delta land for sheep. And Pharaoh even asked that the best Hebrew shepherds take care of his livestock. Yes, Egyptians and Hebrews could get along. Verses 13 through 26 shows us how brutal the last five years of the famine were. Egyptians were forced to trade their livestock and then sell their land to Pharaoh for food. However, the people farmed state land, paid Pharaoh 20% while working as tenant farmers rather than slaves. They got to keep 80% for themselves. Joseph was handling a brutal famine in as benevolent a manner as possible. In verses 27 through 31, Israel lived in Goshen. They acquired property, were fruitful, and grew in numbers. As Jacob was nearing his death, he asked to not be buried in Egypt, but in the family tomb where Abraham and Sarah were buried. In Genesis 48, Jacob accepted Joseph's two sons born in Egypt, but in blessing them, he put his right hand on the younger, which Joseph tried to change. However, Jacob said the younger, Ephraim, will be greater than the older, Manasseh, similar to him and his brother Esau. Remembering the promise to Abraham in Genesis 15, 13 to 16, Jacob realized that Egypt was the other land in which Israel would dwell for 400 years, and thus the clock was ticking. He assured Joseph that God was with him and would eventually move Israel back to the land promised to them. Genesis 49 contains Jacob's patriarchal blessing on his sons, which often contained prophetic elements about the future. For some, their past sins were remembered, Reuben's immorality with his father's concubine, and Simeon and Levi's murder of Hamor's people. While Genesis 38 showed us that Judah was no spiritual giant, verses 8 through 12 identified the tribe of Judah as the one through which the Messiah's lineage would continue. Praised by his brothers, a lion, the scepter and ruler's staff will be with him until Shiloh, or peace, comes, and it is he who people will obey. His robes will be washed in the blood of trampled grapes. In verses 28 through 33, Jacob finished the blessing, asked again to be buried in the family tomb with Abraham and Sarah, breathed his last, and was gathered to his people. In Genesis 50, Joseph mourned his father and had him embalmed. Pharaoh granted his request to bury his father in Canaan, and a large company of chariots and horsemen went to the burial cave. After they all returned from Canaan, Joseph's brothers were still feeling guilty about what they had done to him and were worried that he had been waiting to exact revenge, so they sent him a message pleading for mercy, which brought him to tears. They came to Joseph and fell before him as servants, to which he again assured them he was not mad at them. For what they did with evil intentions, God had used for good, and he would take care of them. In verses 22 to 26, Joseph lived peacefully in Egypt to the age of 110. He saw several generations of grandchildren, and he reminded his brothers of the promise to Abraham that after 400 years in Egypt, God would move them back to Canaan. He also requested that his bones participate in the future exodus. 
which later occurred. Genesis closes as the 400 years the Hebrews would be in Egypt was beginning, and during this time there would be no new revelations from God. Exodus will open towards the end of the 400 years, with God raising up Moses to lead the Hebrews back to Canaan.